so uh, over here, this is uh, what I referred to a little bit earlier was the OSI model. Again, this isn't really all that important for your understanding of ANT. It is kind of nice to see how things map onto uh, more theoretical concepts, I guess. Um, so over here, you, look, you can see that the ANT portion of it, so the chip, integrates all the four lower layers of the OSI model. And your host application microprocessor needs to implement the upper three layers. So that includes your application, presentation, and session layers. And I think the key point in this slide is that the top layer, that, that application MCU layer, is really thin. It's really lightweight. A lot of the stuff in terms of the actual networking, actually all of the stuff in terms of the actual networking, is done by the ANT chip which is really nice because you can use very simple processors and not have to worry about a lot of the details that are done for you by ANT. So the most important thing to understand about ANT is the ANT channel. And an ANT channel is basically a logical link between two ANT nodes. If you understand ANT channels, Everything else is actually uh, based off of the, the simple AND channel and starts to make a lot, of, lot more sense. AND channels are independent. They are self-managed. So again, there's no central coordinator in any kind of an AND network. Each channel manages itself. It's ad hoc, which means that it can be created and destroyed on an, need, an as-needed basis. This is a very powerful feature. And even though it's self-managed and independent, it is still adaptive. So it is still um, aware of the environment around itself. So it'll adapt automatically in case there's any kind of interference. And I'll show you how that works a little bit later on. Uh, our ant channels um, are represented by an arrow. And you'll notice in this depiction here that there's, a, there's one side of the arrow has a big head on it, and the other one has a small head on it. That will probably make a little more sense as we go through some of the more slides. But basically, the, the large arrow goes in the direction of the primary transmitter, which is the master side of the link. And the little arrow goes in the direction of the primary uh, receiver. And that's just basically to depict some of the relationships that, are, that happen between a master and a slave. There are different types of AND channels available to you. There are bidirectional channels, where you can send data in both directions at the same bandwidth from the two ANT nodes. There are unidirectional channels where you can only send data in one direction. There are also things uh, such as shared channels where there's multiple ANT nodes sharing a single channel to send information. And there are other derivatives of uh, channels as well. ANT channels support different types of messages and we'll go into more detail about these as well. But in a nutshell, there's basically three types of messages that are supported over the AND channel. And those are broadcast, acknowledged, and burst. AND channels are the basic building blocks of more sophisticated network topologies. So everything from a peer-to-peer -peer network or connection to a star type of network topology to tree networks where you're actually connecting uh, different star topologies, to things such as shared channels where you're sharing a channel with multiple nodes. An AND channel consists of two nodes. One side of that node is gonna, be, is gonna define the master endpoint. And then the other side is gonna define the slave endpoint. One important thing to realize here is that just because you're, uh, an ANT node is a master to one channel doesn't mean it can't be a slave to a different channel. And that's a very important concept because that is the fundamental um, piece that allows you to connect star topologies together. And that's something that other technologies that do similar things are not capable of doing. Okay, so the master endpoint is the master of the channel. So it controls the channel communications. It is typically thought of as a communication initiator, which basically means that it sends the first message before a connection is actually established. 
It is the primary transmitter, and we call it a primary transmitter because an open AND channel is always transmitting. So it's always transmitting at some kind of a channel period. So if you were to look at a master channel in the time domain, it would look something like this. Um, here on the bottom we just have time, and the left axis just shows when the radio is on and when it is off. So as soon as you open a master endpoint, it's going to start transmitting data packets at a channel period. And the channel period is configurable by your application. It can be anywhere from 200 hertz to half a hertz. Now within the Ant Plus ecosystem, we actually define what that channel period is. So if you're a heart rate monitor and you want to be Ant Plus, you're going to need to make that channel period be 4 hertz because that's what we define it inside of the, the device profile. Each of these messages is sent at a particular power. Uh, the power is flexible. You can go anywhere from 0 dBm to minus 20 dBm. You can generally set that to whatever suits your application. Most people just use 0 dBm because that's the highest power. There are use cases where you want to turn down the power if you don't want to transmit too far. And then the actual packet that's being sent is defined by a couple of parameters. And I want to point out here that each of these packets is essentially the same. Uh, so they're all fixed size packets. So each packet is going to have, first of all, a network key associated with it. Um, for those of you in Ant Plus who have gone through the key exchange process, you know what this is. This is an 8-byte value that um, is unique but the same for all Ant Plus devices. And Mike touched a little bit on the, on the key systems before. There are public keys, which are basically open to everybody, and that's just all zeros. There are managed keys, which is where Ant Plus fits in, where there's one key, but it's shared by multiple uh, companies in order to enable devices. And then there are also private keys where somebody can take and define their own products and make sure that nobody else is able to communicate on their network. Uh, these channel packets are also going to have the channel ID in them as well. So the master owns the channel ID. Each of these packets is going to be sent at a particular RF frequency, and it's going to be the same RF frequency for every packet, or throughout the lifetime of the packet. And then each of these packets also allows you to define eight bytes of application data. So with an AMP Plus, this is going to be defined by your, uh, your device profile. So the device profile is going to tell you how to format those eight bytes of data in order to adhere to the interoperable um, ecosystem of Ant Plus. And as I mentioned before, that's a fixed amount of data that you can send, which is why all of our device profiles are always, always defined at least eight bytes of data per page. So ironically enough, each, each of these parameters you can actually change on a per packet basis. So even though you have to send uh, each of these packets at the same RF frequency with a particular channel ID, you can actually change any one of these parameters on a message by message basis. So for example, uh, RF frequency is a good example of this. If you wanted to implement something like uh, frequency agility, you can create an algorithm that changes the frequency at which each of these packets is sent uh, over each message period, and that's actually the basis of our frequency agility mechanism, which is implemented on the AP2 and available as a reference design. Um, that's not something that's really applicable within Ant Plus. Within Ant Plus, we actually define single frequency systems where each sensor transmits at one particular RF frequency. I'm just going to back up here. So, what we're looking at over here is exactly what a unidirectional channel does. Data is sent in one direction from the master to the slave and there's no uh, opportunity here for your master to get messages back because it's always transmitting, it's not listening. So if you look at a bidirectional channel, it looks something like this. After every message that's transmitted by the master, the master will open up an RX window, a receive window. And the purpose of that receive window is actually twofold. A, it's to receive data from the slave. So if the slave has data that it needs to send, uh, it can do so within that period, in that, in that window. 
But that window is also used for coexistence. So basically to detect any kind of encroaching channels that might be trying to transmit in the same RF area. And I'll go into that in a little more detail uh, as well later on. So I'm going to put the master, bidirectional master channel on the top and start to talk about the slave a little bit. So the, the slave is the communication acceptor. So it needs to find a transmission from the master and accept that message. So the, the slave's job is basically to search for and to synchronize itself to the transmissions of the master. That's why it's called a primary receiver. Most of its time is spent receiving data. So I'll, I'll say a couple of things about the search algorithm because it's, it's fairly important to Ant and it's another unique feature of Ant. Um, basically when a slave channel opens up, it goes into search mode. And in the search mode, the radio RX is basically, the, the receive windows are basically duty cycled at 10% uh, over the entire radio as the slave searches for other devices. The unique thing about the search algorithm is, A, you're given a, uh, a guaranteed latency within which you're going to acquire a master channel. And you're also running in a mode that's still low power. So you could easily find a master's transmission by simply just turning the radio on and waiting until you get that first packet from the master. Unfortunately, that would never allow you to run off of a coin cell battery because you would be consuming too much time trying to find the master's transmissions. So we created an algorithm where the radio is turned on and off at a very specific duty cycle, which will guarantee that you will find the master, albeit at a greater latency, because you're not necessarily going to get the first packet that the master transmits. But you're still able to do a search at, at a low power. So um, still enable your application to run off of a coin cell battery. By the way, none of these diagrams are to, to scale. So once the, once the slave actually finds that first packet, it's then going to need to synchronize its receive window to the transmit windows of the master. And in order to do that, it's going to need to know what the channel period is, because it needs to know when that next packet is going to come from the master. So generally speaking, um, this information is not part of the packet that gets sent across by the master. And within AND Plus, you'll see that this information is um, defined within the device profile. So you would generally hard code this information into your, uh, into your application MCU on the slave side. Now just because you can uh, get data at the same channel period that the master transmits it at, does not necessarily mean that you have to, because it might not suit or be appropriate for your application. So for example, if you've got a heart rate monitor that's transmitting at four hertz, and you've got a very uh, battery sensitive receiver, for example, a watch, watches run off of coin cell batteries and are very sensitive to, uh, to radio on time, especially if they're talking to multiple sensors. What you can actually do is decimate the channel period because you don't need to get every single packet from the heart rate information. It's perfectly okay if you get every second one or every fourth one. And you can very easily do that and adjust your power requirements and your power budget um, by doing little tricks like this. So in order to actually synchronize and to find the transmissions of the master, you're going to need to know a few things. You're going to need to know what the network key is. And again, if you're an Plus member, you're going, to know, you're going to know what that is because you're going to go through the key exchange process with Terry and get that information. Ideally, you're going to know what the channel ID is. And if you don't, you can wildcard it. And then, of course, you're going to need to set your radio to the appropriate RF frequency. Now, a slave, if a slave has data to send, it can do so immediately after receiving data from the master. And you can see that's depicted over here. Important point here is that the slave only, needs, only sends data if it's required. So if your application has, or your, your slave side of your application has data that it wants to communicate to the master, it'll need to send that data uh, before the next channel period is received by the slave from the master. And then that data is going to get queued by the ant chip until it actually receives that packet from the master and then immediately after that, it's gonna send the data back to the master.